I'm super excited to be here. I'm more excited about the theme of why we're here. Revival is something that has brought me to this nation. It's, it's because of revival. It's the promise of revival. When my mom was still in Brazil, um, in her womb, she had a promise that I would be a messenger of my generation. And my generation would see revival. And I am here because I believe in revival. And whenever someone speaks to me or invites me to revival, it just burns inside me. Every message I ever receive from the Spirit of God is on revival. <laughs> and I believe that we are on the verge of a global revival. We, we tend to think that events, uh, um, and, and please don't get me wrong, but we tend to think that sometimes a one-off event is a revival. And we leave the place and we feel pumped. <laughs> but whatever is birthed out of entertainment or a moment, it dies with a moment. But true general revival comes from a persistency of believing in the moment that God is about to do something because he had programmed it. And... The, the trickiest thing about us who follow Jesus is that because of the Spirit, we have insight to what is yet to come. And it's so difficult to deal with what you see that has not yet happened. And the war of the flesh is that you're, 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 you want it to happen because your Spirit has lived this thing that is yet to manifest. And Jesus used to say something very interesting. The kingdom of heaven is here, but it's yet to come. He's speaking about the manifestation of something that although we think spirituality is just this ghostly thing, actually, spirituality is ever more real than the real physical world. Amen. And what the Spirit of God wants to do is bring the dimensions of heaven onto this earth. You know it's real that Jesus one day will come back. That he would step on this land. That he would walk through Jerusalem. That he would take his throne. Do you know that this is real? This is not metaphors and symbolism. The kingdom is coming. And I believe that before this kingdom comes, before this violent manifestation, this rushing power comes on earth, there is a revival of souls like never before. And that revival is souls coming to Jesus. I believe that we're going to see what Billy Graham has not seen in his, in his ministry. We're going to see millions and millions of people come to Jesus Christ. And I want to share with you something that the Spirit has been putting in my heart. And it's in Acts chapter 6 verse 1. And I want to kind of read it as the base to what the Spirit of God is saying to us here today. Acts Chapter 6, verse 1. Once you found it, just say amen, and I know you're with me. If you're still looking for it, just say mercy. <laughs> you're too quick, Gabriel. <laughs> so for those of you that don't know me, I'm from Rio de Janeiro. That's where I was born. I was brought into this country for a promise of God. Um, you know, when my book comes out at the end of the year, you can read it, but it's too long to, <laughs> to go through it. Um, but, you know, I'm someone who lived in the streets. My father was murdered. We waited upon a promise. We came to this country in immigration in January. You can imagine freezing England. <laughs> and um, I came in little Brazilian shorts. And my mom had just one small bag donated with a handful of clothes. No visa, no money. And we're here today by the promises of God. I remember the woman saying to my mom she was going to deport us the same night that we arrived. And I'm still here <laughs> 21 years later. <laughs> Um, but I'm excited for what God has to do here tonight. Amen. Now, during those days, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore... Friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the Spirit and of wisdom. Say with me, full of the Spirit and of wisdom. 
who we may appoint to the task, while we for our part would devote ourselves to prayer and to the serving uh, of the word. Amen? Um, now, I want to quickly jump to verse 8 just for the sake of time, but please read this whole chapter after tonight. It says, Stephan, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Alexandrians and some Syrians and others of those from Sicilia and Asia, stood up and argued with Stephan. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Amen. Um, keep your Bibles open. We are going to nav navigate through some Bible verses. And I want you to also get a pen and paper if you can. Or write some notes on your phone. Um, because we, we, we want to really dig into the revelation of the Spirit tonight. Now, it's amazing how Scripture, how uh, the details of intentional information the Spirit of God allowed the Bible to be written in. Every detail of the Bible is intentionally trying to warn or explain or reveal something to us it's not just a random text is put together and placed it's so strategically um, divinely put together through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and when you read the Bible depending what view or what spirit you're reading from you may miss out the golden keys that unlock the secrets of heaven and uh, when, whenever I'm reading scripture, I'm asking the Holy Spirit, what is it in the word right now do you want to speak to me? Because God has spoken to me hundreds of different subjects through the same scriptures quite often. Where I read it once and I pick something up and I read it again and I pick something else up. And I'm always asking God, what is it that you have to say? Now, I've preached on this chapter thousands of times I've, I've preached around the world especially in american latin uh, um, south america central america and i've preached this quite a number of times um, I, I remember in 2019 i was preaching three times a day seven days a week just evangelizing over and over again and we can get caught up in the repetition of things because we're always on the move we're always doing something and it, it, it's so special when god actually takes time with us to just open the Bible, stare at the text, and hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us. So sometimes I don't like being too busy. Because I want to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. And I began to pray to God at the beginning of this year. And, and it's so funny they were talking about the beginning of the year in September. Because I see the year in September too. That's how we move the calendar in our church. I'm half Jew. So I, I was believing from last year. That something was going to divide this country. I just felt in my spirit God talking to me about praying about division. And one of the things that God was praying to, um, well, telling my spirit to pray, the spirit was encouraging me to pray for reservations. And we began to collect food in the church and do all these things because I felt like a recession was coming over the world. Now, this is before the whole Russian Ukrainian thing, I had no idea. And uh, um, I was just moving by what the Spirit was saying and I began to hear the Spirit of God and I've been preaching about revival for many years in this country and I began to feel the Spirit of God saying to me, there is going to be a, a desperation that will come that will push my people into the needs of coming closer to me. And I heard the Holy Spirit say that. And I said to God, but what do you mean desperation? I felt a physical desperation come upon me as if I didn't have what to eat or how to pay my bill or, or where to sleep. And I, I began to feel like I was back in Brazil and that desperation came. And the Holy Spirit said to me, some people are going to feel like this. I'm going to bring desperation in a place where desperation was never meant to be in. People are going to be hungry in a place they were never meant to be hungry in. Children are going to suffer in a way that when, and, and I would say, but God, are you doing this? He said, no, I'm not doing it, but I'm allowing it so that my name can be remembered once more. And God began to speak to me through chapter 6 in Acts. Because the explosion of the church begins under the needs of desperation. It, it is in the pinnacle moment of the church where it either would break or it would make it's the moment where persecution broke out it's the moment where division tried to divide the church it is in that moment that the spirit of God was loose upon the nations and it begins with the church in Israel in Jerusalem following what Jesus said 
And the 12 are preaching the gospel. They're doing the works of God. They are building the base of the system that's going to spread this gospel around the world. But something begins to happen because whenever you get a group of people together, problems start to come. <laughs> you know, we're, the devil, I feel sorry for the devil. We intend to blame the devil for everything, but really we're the problems. <laughs> because he lost on the cross. He has no power. He only has the power you give him. We are the biggest problem. Did you know that? Yeah, so sometimes when we're washing our plates and the plates fall, uh, um, and we say, oh, the devil is a liar, and, and we use all these phrases, and, and the, you know, your engine of your car goes off, but actually you just didn't service it. But you say that you're under attack. <laughs> and the devil must, you know, stand in hell thinking, I'm really famous. I didn't even come up with that. <laughs> but we are the biggest problem, and the problem begins with a ratio in differences. The first problem in the church is a racial problem between Hebrews and Hellenists who are Greek people that come into the Hebrew culture, the Judaism. The first problem in the church was division because of race and cultural indifferences. Wow. That was the first sign, the first wrestle that the apostles had to deal with. The Hellenist widows were being neglected, bred, charity because the Hebrew the original the native ones felt like they were better and the proportion of things got out of hand and this began to create classes within the community of the church could you imagine and the classes were so indifferent that they began to complain they they started to complain how can we come to worship and we got white singing with white I'm bringing it to modern language we've got blacks going to black church we've got Asian to Asian church and don't get me wrong but I believe in the multicultural church. I believe in the church in this nation that God is calling all nations onto his presence. When I started church, uh, um, um, when the first time I planted the church and we started, we had Brazilians and English. And the tendency was to separate them and do one service in Portuguese and one service in English. And the Spirit of God said to me, no, you're not going to do that. You're going to translate. You're going to be one people. You're going to walk together, talk together, eat together because my kingdom is the culture. Today we're, we're equally balanced. We, you know, we, we, we have Brazilians, English, now we have Spanishes, now we've got Africans coming to the church. And we are somehow, because we're not neglecting the culture of the kingdom, we're somehow moving and growing multiculturally without having to do separate services. But the problem is, me and you, is how we see the move of the Spirit of God. Is how we perceive what God wants to do. And they had the problem because they thought it was going to be a certain way. They thought that the Jews were the privileged. They thought that it came from the Hebrews. It came from, from us. Even Peter had this issue. And that's why God had to take someone like Paul to show him that actually this message is for everyone. And the first thing... Their first inspiration from the apostles is this. Is that we should select among you, and in the original Greek is young men, full of wisdom and the spirit of God. To serve the widows daily distributions of bread. Now when, you, when I read this, I get really, you know, as a pastor, I get, I get confused. I get really, it starts to mess around with my theology because I'm thinking, well, these, these guys walked with Jesus. Okay, we're talking about the apostles. They knew Jesus, they ate with Jesus. They had a profound understanding of the very thing that we're standing on today. And in their head, in their conscious, they knew that to serve bread as the most simplest act of service you could ever do, just give someone bread in their hands and next please. <laughs> That's it. They believed, the apostles, that to do that you had to be full of the Spirit and full of wisdom. And I began, to, I began to just deep this because I thought to myself, hold on. Um, because we tend to put this to preachers and to worship leaders and to, you know, the evangelists and, and the ones that are titled and the ones that went to theological college or university. And then we say, no, these are the wisdoms and the full of the spirit because it's, it's on them. I'm just someone who comes to prayer some and goes home and I pray in my corner and I do my little thing. But, you know, they are the anointed ones. But the apostles believed 
that to serve anything that had the kingdom label on it meant that you had to be full of the wisdom of God and full of his Holy Spirit. That means that if I stand at the door to greet, I've got to have the Holy Spirit and I have to have all the wisdom that God can give me. That means to clean the church, I need to be full of the Spirit and full of the wisdom of God. That means to stand here, I've got to be full of the Spirit and full of the wisdom of God. To organize the chairs, to do the banners, the graphics, to play the instruments, to be in the cameras, to take pictures. I have to be full of the Spirit and the wisdom of God. It's not just for some, it is for all. Joel chapter 2 says, in the last days I shall pour out my, my spirit. I shall pour out my spirit over every flesh. Every flesh. Not over the apostles and the evangelists and the pastors. No, Paul says some he gave to evangelists and some to you. It means that all of us are called to something. We are all birthed for such a time as this. Some of you are like Esther. You're stuck in your palace wondering if am I really here just because I'm pretty or am I here because God has purpose for me and sometimes we have to ask ourselves the question was I born for such a time as this and if so where does the wisdom and the spirit of God come in my life if I'm not on the stage and this is the problem we build this theology when it's a false theology because the real theology is that whatever you serve in the kingdom you are full of wisdom and you are full of the spirit of God and so you should be because in the kingdom of God everything is opposite the human maths <laughs> the last shall be first <laughs> huh when we go to the, Jesus says about the widow, she gave little, but she gave everything because it was in here. It's always reverted to what the eye may perceive. And this is what God has assigned me in 2022 for this nation. This is the message that God has placed me for the next six months in this nation. Is that God is choosing, He's lifting, He's anointing, He's separating servants of the kingdom. That doesn't matter where you are and what you're doing. You are full of the Spirit and you are full of the wisdom of God. Full of it. It says that they had to be full of the wisdom and they had to be of good reputation and they had to have the Spirit of God in them. To serve bread. James, help me. <laughs> to serve bread. I'm not talking about preaching to 500 or 1,000 or tens of thousands or worshiping and having a single number one on Spotify and millions of people listen to you or 25K followers on Instagram. It, it just meant serving widows in a charity event. But they had to be full of the Spirit. And sometimes we do things, oh, no one's doing this, so I'm going to do it. Sometimes we see things in the kingdom of God as because no one's there, then I'm going to figure in the gap. God doesn't want you to figure in the gap. He can figure in the gaps. God wants you to be the empty space that you're looking at. So that it becomes full of the purpose that He has placed inside you. It's not about just filling the gap or looking at what's needed. It's about being the need. You are the need. You are the hope. You are the resurrection. You are the salt of this earth. You are the light. You are the, the message that people are searching every day in their lives is in you. And they cannot just receive this message through a guy on a microphone. Somebody has to relate to somebody who's stuck in drugs. Somebody has to relate to somebody who's been sexually abused. Somebody has to understand the divorced person. Somebody has to understand the single mother with a child. Somebody has to be there. And it cannot be just through somebody or holding the mic. It has to be through the wisdom and the power of the Spirit. Through the ability of the church who serves God no matter where God sends them. But what amazes me is that the Bible says that Stefan began to manifest signs and wonders. And this, this is where I got stuck with the Holy Spirit. I just couldn't understand how someone who was serving bread all of a sudden began to develop in him the miracle, the power 
the manifestations of signs and wonders. When we talk about signs and wonders, we're talking about things like people that don't have limbs and limbs grow again. We're talking about blind people seeing again. We're talking about cancer, leprosy, leaving. That's what signs and wonders means. It's like someone walking in here in a wheelchair and they get up. And they began to walk. That's what the Bible is talking about. Stephan began to manifest these kind of gifts and power through serving widows. <laughs> and we have a generation that's so hungry for popularity, for followers, for money. And we misunderstand that the biggest power of God is in the smallest moments of our everyday life. We're waiting for the big moment. <laughs> But maybe God's waiting for someone to be at the bus stop at the right time to meet the right person. Maybe it's a family member that got into the hospital and you went to visit them. But next to them, there was someone that needed healing and you became the healing. Maybe it was a school meeting and a parent that was suicidal. But your connection to them saved them from the, the depression and loneliness. It, it, it is these moments of simple Moments of life that we neglect every day is these moments that God will work the most amazing supernatural miracles. My biggest experiences with God was when I was on my own. It was little moments. I remember when I was preaching in Brazil in the favela and I was, I was literally saving the whole soldiers of the favela, <laughs> the criminals. And all the boys kept coming to the event and they were accepting Jesus. And we had loads of guns at the altar. And on the third day, the leader said, we're going to kill Gabriel. And I didn't know. So they set up this trap to kill me as I was coming into the favela to, free, to preach on the final day of the crusade. And as I was in the back of the car, the driver, and bear in mind, my driver wasn't even a Christian. <laughs> He's driving into the favela. And all of a sudden, the favela lights were all turned off. Now, in Brazil, if a, if a favela, the lights are off, <laughs> don't go near it. <laughs> it's a no-no zone. <laughs> it's like de walking dead if you watch that series. It's, like, it's just, I'm a geddon. You're going to die. Don't go. But we was too late because we was already up the hill. And if you reverse, trust me, they are watching you. They will shoot the car. And all of a sudden, we see these young men come out and they all have guns and they tell him to put down his window and this boy looks into the back seat where I'm sat and the gun goes across my chest and he does not see me sat on the seat and my driver looks at the mirror and he's shaking and he's terrified because he doesn't believe in God but he's watching a miracle happen right then and then and one of the soldiers say to, to, to the driver, why are you here on your own? What are you doing? I've never seen you here. And he's like, no, I'm just going to go to a church. And the boy says to him, well, don't go to the church because things are about to go down. And he's holding the wheel and shaking. And the windows go up and we carry on. And he, they didn't see me. And I preached again because I'm crazy like that. I preached. And I preached as if it was the last night that I was going to preach. And then I got everyone to accept Jesus, even the ones that wanted to kill me. Because when the Spirit assigns you to serve, it is not by your strength or by your ability. It is the assignment of God upon your life that He says, go. It means that you are secure. You have victory. It means that you cannot lose. It means that He who has bet on you cannot lose His bet. He cannot lose. And, and, and this is what we need to understand. We cannot lose. So when we serve, we don't serve from a place of we're trying to grow or we're trying to reach or we're praying that it might happen. No, no, it will happen. It is growing. It is expanding. It, hope is here. It's the certainty of knowing who you are and you walk in it and you don't negotiate your identity. You are. I wish I had somebody that understood this. You are. So when you walk into a room, it is. God will save. God will heal. God will transform. God will move. But he says that signs and wonders, Luke, Dr. Luke is saying that signs and wonders was coming out of Stephan. And it was so powerful that it began to trouble the religious people. <laughs> Could you imagine this? 
this nobody boy, Greek, he was a Greek, had no background in theology, nothing. All of a sudden, he's serving, and all of a sudden, he's manifesting the miracles that the apostles should be manifesting. Just an ordinary guy. And he's so full of God that what he's doing is provoking religious people to get agitated. <laughs> they get agitated because a system is breaking. Because the Spirit of God does not come to keep us in systems. It comes to liberate you from systems. Jesus says, give to Caesar what belongs to him. But give to God what belongs to God. He wasn't just talking about money. He was talking about everything that belongs to this world, belongs to this world. But what belongs to God, goes back to God. What the flesh gives birth to, only fleshly things. But the Spirit can give birth to spiritual things. And he's performing signs and wonders. Now... I had, to, I had to imagine in my, in, my, in my spirit what this looked like because I just didn't understand, um, James, how he was doing this and serving bread at the same time. And then the Holy Spirit said to me, well, you're a bit silly, so let me help you. So widows were neglected in those days. They were probably lowly, broken, in despair, poor, probably sick. And that's why they were going there to collect bread, to live and survive. In fact, the widow that had lost her son, Jesus had compassion for her to the point he cried. Because the profile, the identity of a widow was severe in those days. It meant that you was literally rejected out of society. You couldn't work, you couldn't make income, you couldn't do anything. So we're not just talking about widows here, we're talking about people who are broken. And potentially in the queue, there were many who are sick. And the Holy Spirit just clicked in my mind. That as Stefan is giving bread, he's coming into contact with their hands. And the Holy Spirit said to me, imagine one of them carrying cancer and touching Stefan's hands. And then the cancer goes. And I began to imagine this in my mind. I just began to imagine an a, a afternoon tea in church for, for us British. <laughs> and we're just coming to church. We're queuing up. You know, we're going to do our little, our little moment there. And, and all of a sudden, while we're queuing up, and well, someone at the desk is giving us a band or something to come to an event. Can you imagine? But I have a problem and then I come to contact with someone selling a t-shirt or giving water. And all of a sudden, I feel something in my body. And the event hasn't even started yet, but because they're full of wisdom and the spirit, when I came into contact with them, something moved in me and I felt a change. Signs and wonders. And then the next one had leprosy and the other one had a limb problem and the other one had diabetes and the other one had, had all sorts of issues. And every time Stefan gave bread because he did it in the spirit and the wisdom, the power of God moved for him and they began to be healed, transformed, chains began to break. Now imagine with me a church, a people, and I believe in the name of Jesus and I prophesy that this nation will be a nation of service to the kingdom of God. That it doesn't matter if it's a t-shirt welcoming at the door, if it's a worship team, that our contact with the broken will fix them, transform them. The power of God will leave us with certainty that He's still alive, He still performs miracles, He's still a saving God, He is still alive in our nation. Oh, hallelujah. He's serving bread, but the Spirit of God is working. Just imagine that with me. It could be a small prayer group in your house. It can be just a Bible devotion that you create. It could be, it could be just a simple prayer in the phone call. It can be a bust up conversation. It can be, just imagine with me, the Spirit of God can break out right now. The Spirit of God can invade your home, your families, your children. If you understand the principle that it's not in the building or the event, it's in you. So when you walk out, it walks with you. When you speak, it speaks with you. I feel the Holy Spirit here. When you move, it moves with you. And revival will come when we understand as a people that the power is within us and not in things. It's in us. And one of the things that God wants to break in this nation is the religious spirit. 
The religious spirit that's crippling our communities, our worship, our preachers. And because of this movement, we have false prophets arising as well. And heresy is being spoken. And as a prophet of God, I have to speak out. And I hope they watch this YouTube video. That God is a God who still establishes His word in 2022. And we got all these heresies and all these movements and all these things. And people just leave the same and come back the same and leave the same. And we're building spiritual addicts who live at the altar but never change. Who live at the altar but never actually bring someone else with them. Who live at the altar for prayer, for your anointing. I need this, I need that. But God can never use you for someone else who needs to. Because it's better to keep you in the system than to release the power that's inside you. But God said to me, like Stefan, I'm releasing my spirit to break every system of religion that has trapped this nation into a limbo of system, repetition, cycles. God says, no more. I'm breaking it. I'm breaking it. I'm breaking it. There's a generation rising up with the power, the spirit of God, with the anointing, with purpose to manifest the power of the kingdom of heaven like never before. And I prophesy in the name of Jesus, wherever your hands go and wherever you serve, the power of the Holy Spirit is going with you. God is about to shake this nation with power. And the religious system was trying to hold and trap this power that was being released because we don't want it if we don't understand it. But when the Spirit comes upon the generation, it comes with wisdom. And there was so much wisdom in him that even when they tried to challenge and debate the vision and what God was doing for his life, they couldn't withstand it. They couldn't debate it. They couldn't even argue with him. Could you imagine the power that will come upon you when you speak to Muslims and Hindus? When you speak to people who have different systems of belief and when they speak to you, they will be confused about their false belief. (laughs) Because you spoke so much wisdom and life that their mind now is asking, who are you? (laughs) They, they, They were so angry, so bitter. That they want to kill him now. And there's a spirit of religion trying to kill our generation. Trying to kill what God is moving and doing. We're too scared. We need it, but we don't want to let it go because we can't control it. You were never meant to control the spirit of God. He can self-control himself. I've never seen the spirit of God lose control or make someone lose conscious or do crazy things. If you're falling and hurting yourself in the spirit, you need to double check that spirit. The Holy Spirit is not here to break your legs and break your limbs and shake you to the point where your head hurts after. Everything He will do, He will do rightly so for you, for your good, for your growth, for your health. So the Spirit doesn't need controlling. He can self-promote and control Himself. He just needs a vessel in which He can manifest Himself through. And it's not through the mic or the events or the hypes. And this is, don't get me wrong, I don't see Prayer Storm as a hype as an event or I wouldn't be here. But it's about the attitude that when you serve God in the sense of kingdomship, when you truly serve the king, then you truly tap into the anointing of revival. Until we learn how to serve, we won't see revival break out in this country. It is not through one preacher, one event, or one movement. It is through the power of serving. Some of you need to get so hungry to serve that when you go back to your church, you annoy your past until he can't sleep. Have anyone seen the film Minions? (laughs) Blah, 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 blah. You got, that's what you literally got to do. You, you got to get into your pastor's head and say, I don't know what you have for me. Is it cleaning the toilet? Is it bringing water to the preacher? Is it standing at the door? Is it, is it putting the chairs in order? I don't know what you have for me, but I need to serve God because until I serve, revival will never break out. But when you begin to serve, then the power of God begins to work through you. Now they tried to kill him. And I find this amazing because... He just started ministry. I don't want that kind of anointing. (laughs) 
you know, some of us waiting years and years to preach and so on. The boy just started serving wonders and signs came and they're already dragging him across the city to kill him. The first martyr of the church. And they place him on the floor. Now, bear in mind, the stones, we're not talking about small stones, okay? They used to pick up big stones with two hands and throw upon the person's head. That's how they used to stone people to death. And he's being stoned and he's now having vision because you can never kill a true servant of God. He sees Jesus sitting at the right throne. Heaven is opening up. There's this supernatural thing happening. And in the middle of all that, are you with me? There's this one boy called Saul. And Saul's watching, religious, sat under the best theologian of his time. Full of intelligence, wisdom, double nationality, Roman and Israelite. And he's watching and he's clapping and he's approving. He's saying, kill him. Kill the plan. Kill the purpose. Kill this movement called the people of the way. Did you know that Christians were not called Christians? Then they were called people of the way. Kill them. Destroy them. In fact, I have more letters to go all to all the regions. And I'm going to Damascus soon to destroy every single hub of these people who just pray loud and look crazy. I'm going to destroy. I'm going to cancel their movement because they don't know who I am. And the Bible says in chapter 7 and 8, and you please read in your own time, that while they were stoning this young man who was serving in wisdom and power, while they were stoning him because they couldn't argue with him, they couldn't, you know, get, get over the fact that he was just chosen. And while this is happening, they began to bring his cloak. And, and, and this was a costume of that time. They would take the clothes and the robes and they began to place it at the feet of Saul. And I began to read this because I realized that every purpose on earth cannot die with the human. Even when Elijah was taken, Elisha had to carry on the ministry. Are you with me? And people say, oh, but the, the old generations in England, they used to, you know, serve God. I don't know what's going on with this generation. But I came to announce to you that it cannot die. What John Wesley did cannot die. What Spurgeon preached cannot die. What John Knox did cannot die. What the great missionaries of this nation accomplished cannot die. And we may be wondering what happened between those generations to this generation. And I came to tell you that what God started cannot die. The flame will never stop burning. It's just a moment of time for God to do the revival, the super awakening that we have been waiting for. And he's there, he's approving and they're laying the clocks upon his feet. And this is a spiritual symbolism to say that whatever is on Sephan is now on your feet. And while Paul thinks, which was then Saul, I'm killing him, I'm destroying him, I have succeeded in the spiritual realm, the words that came out from Zephan cannot come back empty. So it has to find destination and it has to change something. Oh God, I feel the Holy Spirit. And you may be wondering, I didn't see results, I didn't see effect, nothing changed while I was serving. My church still feels a bit slow and, and snails and turtles and I'm trying to get more, that's why I come to prayer storm. But God is saying you may not see it with your eyes but it cannot come back empty keep going keep doing keep pushing keep serving it is coming turn to the person next to you and say it's coming if you give up now you may miss the greatest revival of your lifetime it is coming it is coming it is coming hallelujah it is coming so here goes now in the physical world, this religious boy saw, thinking I did it. I'm going now to destroy the rest of them. And then Jesus shows up. Because someone who served faithfully provoked the spiritual realm to move even when they were no longer around. Your prayers are going beyond your physical presence. Your worship is pushing beyond your physical presence. The things that God is doing in your life is pushing beyond your eyes. Your family is coming to Jesus. Your friends are being delivered. 
You may not see it now, but I prophesy as someone whose dad was a mafia leader, killer, but died saved by the blood of Jesus. Because when God says pray, he does the change. When God says believe, he causes the manifestation. For one year, my mom prayed for my father's life. He would literally put guns to her head and drag her out of the church because he hated the church. And God said to her, you will not divorce him, you're going to pray for him. And for one year, my mother prayed to the point where he would pull triggers and the bullets wouldn't come out, the gun wouldn't work. Could you imagine living on the edge every day not knowing if your husband's going to kill you? Because he was so drunk, so high in cocaine that he didn't even know what he was doing. He was full of demons. And my mom prayed and prayed. And so a funny story, my mom would pray during the night when he was drunk so he didn't know where she was. And prayed and prayed and prayed and then one day my dad accepted Jesus. You may not see it, but it's coming. And then I was born out of a woman that couldn't get pregnant. You may not see it, but it's coming. You may not see it, but it's coming. And I wish I had somebody that understood that what's happening in parliament is a reflection that God is saying, I'm getting ready to put all the back in the, this organization. I'm getting ready to put the pieces. Whenever God allows a nation to get confused and to divide us because he's saying, now it's my turn to send the Elijahs to restore the altars and unite the people one more time so that the flames of heaven can fall down on the altars. And then there goes Paul, you know, the religious one. And Jesus is saying, Paul, so, so, why do thou persecute me? Listen to the words of Jesus to him. He says, now I will show you and teach you what it's like to suffer on my name. The very thing that that young man was serving with, that they killed him for, now falls upon Paul. <laughs> one soul in the room. That wrote 90% of the New Testament. Oh, I wish I had somebody that understood. One soul in the room that changed the cause of the world through the gospel. One soul in the room that heard the words of that young man. And although he didn't understand what was going on because he was approving what really was happening was death and was saving the one soul that will save millions of souls. And it's not about the event, the place, or the quantity. It's about being effective when God calls you. And God may call you to one, but that one may win a thousand. And a thousand, ten thousands. I don't know who I'm speaking to, but where is your one? Billy Graham was in the small crusade, in a small group of meeting, when he heard the gospel, when something began to burn in his life. And in that moment, it burned so strong. And we have one of the greatest evangelists of our time. It wasn't the event, it wasn't the crowd, because it wasn't even in the stadium. There's a little farm, countryside, American crusade, mini one. Small people in the group. But Billy Graham heard the gospel. Something burnt in him. And he didn't want to be a farm boy. He wanted to be a preacher. And millions of souls has come to Christ because of his evangelistic ministry. One soul. Everyone talks about Paul, but I'm wondering sometimes, James, does anyone talk about Stephen who fished Paul? And the Holy Spirit said to me, the fish of fishers. We're so focused on the one that does a lot of the work that we miss out the one that did all the work. The hardest work wasn't what Paul was doing. That was hard. But harder was to die so that he could live. And Jesus says, there is no greater sacrifice in love than laying down your own life for your brother and friends. Do you know what Jesus is saying to us? Do you love the gospel to the point that you give your life for it? Are you willing to die for this message? How far are you willing to go so that the other one can carry on the ministry? No, but it has to be me, Pastor. It has to be me. I need to be the one on social media. I need to be the one on the video. I want to be the one in the picture. But God is asking you, do you really or do you just need your inheritance in heaven? What is greater? What is bigger? There's a revival coming to this nation. But God is calling us to serve like never before. And I'm finishing here now. 
He's calling us to serve like never before. And I came here with one assignment, one thing God said to me. Release an anointing for servanthood. God said to me, pray over them. And I'm about to release such a heavy anointing service that when they go to serve again, they won't be the same. I am opening the floodgates of heaven and pouring out the end time anointing of servanthood. That no matter how much they try to kill the church and the laws try to challenge the church, no matter how many walls they build around us, the gates of hell shall not prevail. We will serve in the building. If they shut the building, we will serve in the streets. And if they keep us out of the streets, we will serve in the prisons. Like Paul and Silas. And if the prison can't keep us, we will keep serving. It doesn't matter where God sends us. We will serve in the hospitals, in the educational system, in the politicians. We will serve. We will serve. We will serve. Is there anybody here that's declaring with me and with the Spirit of God, I will serve. I will serve in Manchester, Liverpool. I will serve across the country, across the nations. I will serve. They might try to put you in prisons. They might try to block you. They might tell you it's soon enough we're going to see laws coming that will stop us from even worshipping publicly. But God is calling a generation that will not stop serving. Even if they kill us, we will serve. And you will see the move of God move like never before. Now it's coming. I'm not asking you to believe in it. It's up to you if you want to believe it or not. But what I do see spiritually is an ark, the ark of revival. And God's calling and soon the door's about to shut. And God wants you to be part of the greatest revival that's about to hit the earth. It's not if it will, it will happen. The invitation is not for God, it's for you. We shouldn't be praying God bring revival. We should be praying God prepare me for when you send your revival. We should be praying, God, revive again and revive again. And this is what the Holy Spirit said to me. Pray that when it does happen, because it's put in His agenda, we will be ready for the move of God and we will miss it. Because if you don't, someone else will. But He only needs one or two or three in the room to move the country under the fire of the Holy Spirit. I see people being baptized. I see people receiving the gift of tongues. I see people receiving gifts of the Spirit. I see people accepting Jesus Christ in bus stop streets. I see people accepting Jesus Christ in university classes. I see the power of God moving like never before. I don't know if you know, but in my home country, the president accepted Jesus last year because we are moving in the belief that revival is here we are moving the nation in the belief now we are literally controlling the Brazilian parliament and we will not stand for corruption we will not stand for the works of Satan all because we believe in the revival we used to be 45% Catholic country now we are over 59% of the whole population we evangelists we are evangelicals Pentecostals even the Catholics now are starting to behave like us because they realize that the power is with the people that call on the spirit and the name of Jesus and I'm trying to tell somebody here the Anglican church is about to get hit with the fire of the Holy Spirit the Catholic church is about to get hit with the fire of the Holy Spirit there is a division happening God is pulling his own to himself so we're going to gather Catholics Anglicans Baptists Methodists we're all going to gather together because God is separating he's putting us from the religious he's putting us for those that lost sight from the vision and he's calling the spirit filled chosen vessels your spirit here Jesus says those that know my voice those that follow me my sheep they know my voice they come to me when I call he's calling us for such a time as this I feel the Holy Spirit he's calling us to walk in power your hands are going to feel cancer being healed your hands are going to feel someone get up of a wheelchair your mouth is going to see people give their life to Jesus you are going to experience what you have read about I prophesy in the name of Jesus through your service you shall live the greatest revival of your life now I want to invite you quickly I think I've abused time sorry James hopefully you'll have me back (laughs) but I feel the Holy Spirit here I want to do two prayers with you today the first prayer that I want to release before I pass the mic is this is that when you serve 
the anointing of signs and wonders are going to serve with you. Afternoon, lunch, and all these charity things we do will never be the same again. Something's shifting. Food banks are shifting. Let me tell you something. There is a crisis coming where food bank will be needed in churches. People are going to come to church because they're going to need food. And when they come, the power of God is going to touch them. I'm telling you as a prophet, I've seen it. It's coming. Prepare. If you're your leader of your church, tell your church, get ready. Get the food bank ready. Get the things ready. There's something coming to this country that's going to heal a lot of families. But the church is going to be their salvation. But you're saying, Pastor, I want to serve with power. I want to really experience in my life the anointing that they experience in Acts. To serve and see the signs and wonders of God. If you want that, come here quickly. Run to this altar because I want to pray with you.